Um, all right, everyone, uh, thank you for joining. Um, you know, we're, we're going to just go ahead and kind of dive in and talk to you guys a little bit about what's been going on behind the scenes, what to look forward to, and um, open up discussion on a few different topics. Um, Chris, I know that you wanted to maybe just go into detail a little bit about kind of what I'm calling the three acts of, of what's to come. Um, maybe you can just give a little bit of a heads up of, of that so that we have a clear understanding. Um, and then we can kind of move into the other topics. Yeah, so this is maybe a refresher for some of you, but just to, to review kind of what's going to happen between now uh, and launch, the, the first thing that we'll be doing is, is rolling out uh, what we're calling the limited mainnet release. Um, and that's, that's going to be, uh, for the first time, influence on StarkNet mainnet, um, and, which I'm pretty excited about. Uh, that's, that's what we are pretty heavily in the process of testing right now. We're deep, deeply into the integration portion. Um, and, um, you know, what, what you'll see in that release is uh, the ability to bridge your assets from L1. Um, so the bridge will be live. Um, <clears throat> you'll see the ability to re-roll those, um, those Arvad crewmate assignments. Uh, they will now be uh, for real. They'll be immutable when they're finished. Um, but that's, I think, something that has a lot, a lot of people excited, the ability to kind of take in all the new information and uh, maybe make a more informed choice about that. Um, you'll see also the ability to, to do the long range scan of your asteroids, which is the, the bonus scan, um, as well as name them, put them under crew management, form your crew, uh, as well as recruited aliens. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of exciting things coming there. Um, all on on Starknet, so also cheap, which is pretty awesome. Um, so that is the 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 limited release, which is coming very soon. Um, after that, you'll see pre-release, um, and pre-release is what we've been talking about uh, as kind of the full the full gameplay for exploitation, but on testnet, uh, which will basically allow you to get get familiar with the game. It's going to be our uh, as as true to reality rollout of influence on testnet um, and that will run uh, effectively while we're we're waiting for 4844 and volition to launch um, and those those will then bring us to uh, the true launch of exploitation um, so that's kind of the the three phases um, the last three phases leading up into launch um, and we're really excited about uh, how soon you'll be seeing the first one Yeah, uh, I saw a question there of crew naming. Uh, yes, crew naming. You'll be able to name your crew. Or wait. Super uh, exciting. Did you right. mention that there is already a habitat on Adelia Prime? Sorry if I came late for that. Oh, yeah, there will be, there will be that, that one, uh, one Adelia Prime habitat that you'll be able to start, um, start playing in and, and forming those crews and recruiting your crewmates into. So that, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's not we the whole colony that's yet, going to be on yeah. AP to start with. That'll just be a single habitat, but that's because in order to create a crewmate, you, you will need to do that in a habitat, so it's just sort of mechanically needs to be there. The colony will be built around that habitat, though. So, Yeah, yeah you so can imagine that, that, zero. First, that first little shelter that, that sprung up. Um, one question we already have for this is, will Adalians be mintable with limited release? Uh, we were actually just talking about that. I don't want to give a final answer yet, but I think we're leaning towards yes. Um, but I think we need to we need to make sure all of that's possible. Yeah, leaning towards yes. I mean, I, I think there's um, there's a couple of things we've spoken about in the past uh, regarding sort of a, um, a limited access just prior to the launch of like the public, fully public exploitation um that's still something that can and will be maintained even if there are adelians minted um but yeah we're, we're leaning towards it i think it's it's pretty fun going through that recruitment process and um i think it'll give people some some exposure to the game and to be honest it'll give people the opportunity to to do some things on starknet which there hasn't been all that much to do yet so i think people will be excited to have something yeah uh, not just in this community. i think uh, chris put it to me the other day that was pretty uh, powerful was that we're still the third most used contract on testnet currently um so yep. as soon as we're on mainnet i'm i shudder to think 
uh, <laughs> what it'll end up being once we have full playability. We're actually number one on the uh, on the girly rich list. Yeah, we are. We'll do our best to redistribute that for, for pre-release. Thank you for your service, everyone who bought asteroids in these last uh, testnet phases. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, moving on from kind of the three acts and what you can expect here in, in you know, uh, the, the future, um, I want to kind of just give room for Sergey to maybe go into a little bit of detail on what he's been working on, especially kind of the the buildings and the UI and where that's at. Um, and and you know, if you want to color that in as much as you want, Sergey, in terms of ray tracing, whatever else, by all means. But um, I, I think you you know better than all of us uh, what's going to be important. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I'll just quick go over my my day to day, like what's been going on over the last two weeks. Um, before I even get into ray tracing, I'll just give a shout out to uh, to you, JP, because we work together. We one of the things was putting together um, basically an updated format for MediaKit, um, which is something we've um, been needing. This is also a thing that like shows that we're getting near. We're we're we we can see it. The end is in sight. We're um, We've we've been pulling together folders of all um, the different concept artwork for the game uh, and other stuff that we want to share with outlets and creators and anybody else who wants to like kind of um, either write a piece about us or um, do videos or anything like that. So um, that's that's in progress right now. We've we've outlined all the media kits. So and the second version of that that I'm kind of in progress on right now is getting those the 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 fun part which is messing around with the blender renderer and making all of our in-game assets look as awesome as possible for those really really sweet uh juicy renders and um as you guys have seen some of the stuff i've been posting over the last couple of days um was me having a lot of fun discovering that, for example, like you know, our, our a lot of our scenes and our buildings for now are set at night, and they will be the in-game assets are going to be nighttime. That was a that was a calculated thing on our part because we just do, we don't we don't have the tech nor the um, runway right now to set up like full daytime night cycles. That's a really really cool thing. Hope to bring it to you someday, but for now they're set at night. Uh, but in Blender, there's this awesome feature where you can basically do an artificial sun. And we spent we spent about a day with Proto, uh, really fun, go going into the nuances of the temperature of the Dalian star and how it would look like, and the albedo effect of the different asteroids and how he thinks the asteroids might look like versus the different outputs from the the ray tracing renderer. Um, and so that was a really, really fun, I think, thing to do for a day. Um, but ultimately, the stuff that's in the media kit, I don't even think any of those like daytime sort of images, those are all um, basically test renders. And there will be something that might be good to build of the basis for the future future dynamic lighting tech on. Um, but they're, they're not even going to go into the media kit. They're just explorations. Um, all the stuff that's going to go in the media kit is going to be those sweet um, nighttime scenes with the with the starry night sky, and they're all going to be the dark side of the asteroid. Uh, but even amongst the dark side of the asteroid, we are giving you know some artistic leeway to make to make and set up those scenes to look as beautiful as they absolutely can. And um, actually, and that that leads directly into this last part, which is after we've got all the great media and, and, and render kits going, these um, we're gonna we're, I'm gonna talk, put the focus back on the final building assets. And this is from these really, really sweet scenes, we're gonna generate the final thumbnails that are gonna go into like the like, kind of like 2D when you just click on a lot on the surface of the asteroid. We're gonna generate really nice looking thumbnails from that. Um, and then finally, it's gonna be tweaking and outputting uh, the stuff that I was testing around with, I think a, a few weeks ago too, and also shared with you guys like, hey, the spaceport got down to like, you know, 25 megabytes. We've been working with an awesome outsourcer, uh, former coworker of mine who um, has massively reduced 
the size, the file size of the 3D models uh, so that they could be served up on a browser so they can, you know, be downloaded super duper quickly. And we're going to be finalizing those so that all of our buildings and ships and stuff like that will uh, look great and spin in a browser for y'all. So, yeah, I'd say that's a good recap of my my last two weeks. Yeah, I'd love to touch on that just really quickly. I think, you know, um, when when we talk about, like, all the time that are being, is being spent on buildings and, you know, the art that's being produced for the game, um, this is our opportunity to kind of set the stage for everything that we do in the future and to craft that style and the, like, unique look for influences really important. This is not a cookie cutter game that's using assets that we've been purchasing, you know, off of some random website. Like everything is is for influence. And I think that's going to make a huge difference um, in, in the long run uh, because we have, you know, something that anyone will be able to see and probably at some point be like, oh, is that from influence? And I think that makes a pretty huge impact um, long term on kind of just recognition of the game slash brand and all of you guys will get to enjoy it from you know crewmates buildings whatever else it might be um and then a note on kind of the media kit and what we've been working on there uh this is going to really help us internally to build out content and things like that to push out and make it feel consistent but i think the more fun part about it is i know some of you guys in the audience like to make content uh put videos together and as the game releases and you might want to put together gameplay strategy videos, something like that, you're going to have access to a uh, pretty nice and robust approved set of, you know, professionally <laughs> designed assets that are all ready for you and organized. And it's going to be better than our current media kit. And, and I think you guys are just going to really enjoy that. So um, that that's super exciting. Um, so yeah, thank you, Sergey. Uh, Proto, maybe maybe you want to touch on a little bit about what you've been working on now that you've gotten the JSON out. Uh, by the way, huge congrats on that. The production chain people rejoice. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so as I think most of you have at this point heard last week, um, I got through the last of the, the production chain process timings. Um, and so that was sort of the last big piece that I was needing to be able to release the most recent updated version of the production chains. Um, and and you guys have already had a chance to sort of tear into that, that JSON file a little bit. Um, you know, had a great little sort of informal AMA last week about that. Um, but now that that's under, under my belt, um, I'm able to, I've been diving into the balancing process for, for the production chain processes, um, which is pretty interesting. It's, you know, I'll, I'll go into more detail about it once it's in a place where, um, you know, I've actually got some balanced numbers and I'm feeling comfortable about that. But in general, the idea is basically asking the question, how much time, like, what's it, what is the time cost of each product in the game um, based on, you know, certain modeling assumptions? Pretty much like for, you know, for a, a raw material you're extracting, like that time cost has a lot to do with like what's the average deposit size and, you know, the, the curve that we've got for the extraction timing, you know, you can sort of compute a you know, average, you know, real life seconds per, per kilogram of material sort of number for each of those things. And then um, you go from there, like, you know, okay, I can make this from, you know, these two raw materials, I can make this from these raw materials, you sort of build your way upwards from there. Um, and sort of figure out like what what the number of inputs for each of those um, you know sort of more refined products are, and you sort of build your way down deeper into the production chains. And you know obviously there's a lot of cases where there's multiple ways to get something, and so sort of deciding which of those you know, which of those ways to use or how much of each of those ways to use is kind of the the crux of the issue in a lot of ways. Um, and, and making sure that you don't like get yourself into a loop, <laughs> as some of the production chain people know, is a problem. Um, but basically, in the end, what you end up with is is a, a ranking of that sort of um, you know amount of time per kilogram of, of material or per unit of that material um, in the game. And that you know is majorly what I'm trying to do with the balancing is to make sure that those are where where they need to be. Um, but also looking at at the actual like um, usage of raw materials on on asteroids. Um, pretty much like going through that whole production process, you know, you can actually compute like some estimated amounts of things that are being used um, as you go through there based on kind of those relative weightings of like, you know, how many processes use this, um, you know, in certain amounts. Um, and that, that ends up actually telling you like, you know, sort of an estimated amount of each of the raw materials that are being mined. 
then you can actually back that out based on the both abundances of the asteroid types and see like which asteroid types are being used more or less um, and sort of that gives you an idea of maybe how you can balance um, the abundances on those asteroids so that so the asteroids are sort of evenly used and not all like you know focused all on one particular type of asteroid or whatever um, so that's that's kind of the ultimate goal there is to to get at those um, spectral abundances for the asteroids. So I'm, I've been working on that. Um, another thing that I think a lot of you might actually be pretty excited to hear about is that we've been leaning into um, finally completely specifying the traits um, and, and the numbers for the trait traits, um, the bonuses for the traits, and the uh, our jobs. So these are sort of the things like you know how much does the buster trait give for for you know extracting you know for the various things that, like there's a lot of numbers there that I think all of you have been sort of like waiting for 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 a while and we are getting very close to like having some some final numbers that would be you know I say final but numbers that we will be using for for pre-release um, and being able to release those and the specific um, usages for those those different things so that's that's just an exciting thing that's sort of going on at the same time and I guess one of the last things is that um, I I am assisting Sergey however I can with um, the crew management um, UI, which is sort of what he's diving into at the moment. Um, there's a lot of interesting, and we've talked about this in previous AMAs, but the the um, various actions for managing your crew, so like creating a crewmate, um, you know, moving crewmates around between different crews and forming new crews, those are all sort of actions that you can take vis-a-vis -vis your, your crew, and so we've been looking into what the UI for that um, Will, will look like. And you know, Sergey's obviously doing all the heavy lifting there, but I'm, I'm sort of standing by to assist with that. So yeah, that's pretty much what I've been working on. Um, but yeah, we're, you know, as usual, moving along really fast. And, you know, you can see how close we are to, to a full test net release. And it's getting really exciting, so. We're flying. It's exciting. Yeah, we just had a, a, a mammoth brainstorm session on all the crew management stuff. Which is just one one little one, like I, I I say little um we're still gonna build it all but it's one last sliver of kind of undesigned un untraced UI left that we need to cover um but yeah the end is very much in sight the end of the beginning <laughs> exactly um <clears throat> so I mean I think that's about it in terms of just like general updates um we'll you know uh, i know we'll get questions about dates we don't have a date yet for anything uh, for you guys yet um we will give you that as soon as we can um so I, I think maybe a fun conversation to to bring up i saw that there was a lot of talk in in general uh, this week over kind of uh, artificial intelligence and bots uh, within games and, you know, how games are going to probably struggle in the future to try and keep them out of their game. And so kind of the alternative to that is to embrace them and figure out unique ways to design games that um, afford, you know, humans uh, the ability to still have fun in the games, even if, if bots exist. Um, I know Influence is is doing that, uh, or at least we're, we're, we're working with the, the system to attempt to do that. Uh, and, and, you know, I think I would love to just kind of open up the floor. We don't have to talk on this for too long if, if no one's uh, too interested. But if you guys have general questions about the game, uh, what we talked about, or if you guys want to talk a little bit more about this uh, in terms of, like, how Influence is, is designing a game to allow for this. I know Chris has some thoughts on this, and um, we, we'd love to make this a bit more... Um, understood, because I, I think it's going to be a pretty prevalent thing that we see in gaming uh, in the coming years now that literally anyone can build a bot with chat GPT. Well, I'll see. Yeah, if anybody else wants to speak or Chris wants to put out, put out there, I, I have one little interesting tidbit to add that I'm not um, obviously um gonna be technically inclined nor am i um you know in a position to to say what unstoppable games is is going to or not going to do when it when it comes to botting i think chris is ultimately gonna yeah there's definitely some interesting conversations around like <laughs> how do you design an open game and also limit bots and and you know <laughs> that's that's a huge huge question mark yeah, yeah. It's permission it's permissionless right that i guess that was the one thing that i was gonna say that it strikes me as fundamentally different 
from other games. And there's this there's this like other story because I was reading about right when you have permissionless, which is a quality of public blockchains, right? And that you're gonna have people who use those permissions in whichever way they want and they don't always have to like align with you and your project that's why you'll have a lot of like spammy maybe if we call this like adversarial type activity um botting automating um you know we're making an unstoppable game but that kind of means that people will all are also can't be stopped when they build stuff on top of that um so I think we're just entering a new era. It was, <clears throat> but it was very, very interesting. Uh, like the example that comes to my mind too is, is like the the base layer two, right? That just launched like a couple months ago from from Coinbase, and it's like they were all excited about like letting developers build whatever whatever they wanted. They uh, launched their own layer two so that people could build cool and interesting projects on it. And so what were the first types of projects that were launched on that L2? They were like these meme coins that got rugged, right? So like clearly someone misusing the per the, the intent of them launching their, their L2 to kind of do these kind of the stuff that other people do in this permissionless metaverse. Um, but it's just an interesting example that I think will will come to to play out and um I'm, we're we're along for the ride and we're going to be here with with the community the cool thing is like we we can get through this together i think we can talk see what you guys all think i think the discussion had about like you know the potential the potential harm that the botters could cause to the economy right is already a, a great discussion and then from there we can you know possibly go go through it together to see what what possible rectifications or anything we need to do to the ecosystem uh, to allow yeah. or not allow different oh, things. Go for it, Chris. I think when it comes to bots, like there's a there's a couple of things I, I think that make influence fairly well suited for dealing with them. One and both of them come down to the fact that this game is uh gonna be so social. Um like I think that a lot of the very strategic decisions that are made are going to be very social or political or involve quite a lot of, um, I don't know, non, non straightforward logical thought. Um, and then on top of that, I think that like having a, a large community, a social community, um, there's all sorts of ways, you know, reputation systems, bot bounties, et cetera, that we can, we can put in place as a community. Um, I think that can do a better job at combat combating bots than uh, any uh, you know software we try to to put in place. Um, because ultimately, like if you're fighting bots, you're just you're fighting bots with other bots. So it's just kind of a race to, race to the bottom as to which bot is going to be the best at exploiting the system. Whereas if you if you really bring that like human social element into it, it's it becomes much more difficult to um, be successful. Uh, I think they'll always be present, just like they're always present in every MMO. Um, but like their success level can be. Yeah. Uh, One tempered. thing I also want to mention is like, I, I don't think it all has to be doom and gloom about like bots interacting with the economy and ruining things or whatever. It's, there's actually a lot of opportunity for emergent gameplay uh, with an influence due to the permission system and having people be able to build bots. And I think that's actually the more exciting part that I'm super, super uh, <laughs> just in general excited to look uh, at who's going to be building these unique bots in game are they going to be you know uh liaisons when you enter an asteroid and you interact with a crew and they give you like tasks to do or are they going to you know actually be built to do multiple step refinement processes or uh can you make quest lines where you try and find these these bots that people have made that are similar to like you know world of warcraft quest uh, style things where you're, you're maybe going to have to jump around to three or four asteroids before you complete the quest line, and that can all be that can all be done to right? both make the experience deeper and provide extra value to the asteroids that kind of like utilize them because you might have marketplaces on those asteroids, and part of the quest could be 
you know, you go do something at a marketplace and in return that player may get preferential treatment slash discounts at like alliance controlled. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just a lot that can happen here and there's because of the unique permission system that, uh, you know, Chris and, and Proto really have been working on for a long time. I think what we're going to end up seeing is curious minded developers uh, who are passionate about games, which there are lots of them, modding communities already <laughs> exist, are going to start building really interesting things. I mean, thanks to everyone already who's a community developer here who has built some really cool things, but I think bots just make it even more fun. Uh, make it... I think... I love, I love the glass half full take, by the way, but it makes me think, you know, we, we still need to go in there with eyes wide open all the glass half full take on all the different things people could build that are you know like beneficial bots but as as i think we've seen with like you know base layer two or something like that what do you, what else is going to be built or the, the first and easiest thing that's going to be built is probably you know these kind of farming bots yeah like joey makes a good point uh you know the word bot needs to be separated from like player assisted tools versus automated systems yeah that's a it's a good point i i think um i actually wrote a post yesterday of just kind of language in general and how we tend to lump things together and it can it can cause confusion because of the lack of specificity um and and yeah i think i think we're we're at an exciting time where people can build systems and tools uh much more easily and that could provide a lot of immersive mm -hmm. gameplay in influence and it's designed specifically to have that that platform to enable um, emergent gameplay and that's not just you know mechanics that we've built um so i know i know chris is very excited about emergence of of gameplay that's that's kind of like a huge factor um that that went into influence and so um chris i don't want to speak for you but i'm sure you would froth at the mouth to see you know a hundred brand new ways to play influence that no one no one ever thought of before <laughs> Yeah, I, I hope we see that. I mean, I think like that's the most exciting part about, um, you know, I guess open world sandboxes um, is that a, a fairly interesting rule set can can give rise to like all sorts of different potential gameplay possibilities. I, I'm yeah, really excited I'm... to see that. I think still probably, I think I'm still probably the most excited in seeing the various different ways that people decide to organize themselves um you know supported supported presumably by smart contracts i think that's going to be like hugely yeah i think that's going to be an interesting one for uh, us as a team in terms of like uh do we need to build alliance tools will a community do that what reputation systems will exist you know there's things like guildly that are being built on starknet that help manage alliances and assets uh, and then the permission system baked into influence already is pretty robust. So uh, there's there's a lot of opportunity here, and and you know it's it's hard to think about everything that could potentially happen. If I may, if I may openly, for may, maybe for the sake of some other people, openly devil's advocate here, but um, in in the event of yeah, how players organize here could could automated tools or automated bots actually end up being adversarial or the enemies of player organization because in the event where you know in a in a, in a traditional game like a a permission game which tries to play whack-a-mole and get rid of the automated botters and stuff like that then players will need you will need other players to survive to like kind of mass an army you'll need extra pairs of hands but in the uh, permissionless system you know, you could just build a bot army that would accomplish accomplish a lot of the social functions um, for for grouping and amassing economic uh, kind of power. Yeah, I mean, I think um, that's naturally taken that care of pretty heavily with conflict in this game and discovery, um, in part, uh, simply because if you have a bot farm, like uh, it's just gonna get blown up. <laughs> True. Not if yeah, the I mean, there might itself. have to be organized groups. Maybe we have to kill uh, Skynet in influence here. 
I just think it's interesting, and I think we, you, you, you guys are absolutely right that one, these these capabilities will take a while to come to the forefront. It's going to be a brand new game for a long time. And I think one of the, um, some someone mentioned in in general uh, the, the two days ago that it, like you can rent a bot farm for twenty five dollars or somewhere somewhere else to do a thing, and I was like, yeah, well, sure, it costs twenty five dollars to rent the computing capacity or whatever, but you're still going to need a decent amount of um, time to build something that's influence specific that 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 does it. Um, but if there is value to be made, people will build it. And I feel like they it, it's likely that they will build it long, long before uh, conflict and stuff like that arrives, you know, while while we're still in the economic mix and where the game is going to be comprised of economic warfare long before um you know the, the we kind of allow for asset destruction in the game world um i saw that uh olmops kind of asked or uh you know both Jush and olmops kind of asked questions around you know what are we doing at starknet summit uh why aren't we at gamescon and i know uh Doug, or chris you you already um answered that but you know, uh, I just want to say here that we're really excited to showcase the game. And when it is ready to be showcased in full force, we will be doing that <laughs> as much as possible. Um, right now, it's it's really just, um, you know, kind of holding our cards closer to our chest to, to make sure that when we we are ready, um, that it, it can be pushed as hard as possible. Um, so, you know, with... Starknet Summit, we don't have like a big keynote uh, talk or anything like that. Um, we're really there um, to uh, one, you know, show off influence to people there. But two, uh, there's a lot of very important uh, people there uh, in terms of partners that we've been working with for multiple years now. And we want to make sure that we can get some face time with them, uh, get closer, make sure we're on the same agenda and uh, make sure that, you know, things uh, that we're going to need at launch are going to be there. So, um, you know, that's that's kind of a primary factor for um, the summit and uh, for, you know, why aren't we at Gamescom? You know, the answer is just we don't have a full game yet to to kind of push to people. And it just doesn't seem like a good use of money to go to. Um, you know, big conventions and things like that yet in, until we have, you know, something that we could really showcase. Um, well, I don't see a lot of questions being asked. Um, we can go a little bit longer here. Uh, we have time, but if people don't have questions, then uh, you know, we can we can hop off here. Uh, we're not trying to keep you here. <laughs> this isn't uh, sign in. Uh, you know, it's not school. Absolutely. <clears throat> Back to <laughs> yeah, work. I'll give it another so minute to see and if get things underway even faster. Um, oh yeah, good question from uh, Gamer. Uh, when when do you think that showcase would be? in terms of just being able to showcase the game. <laughs> I mean, we can't give you dates yet, uh, to be perfectly honest. Um, the reason why we're not giving dates is when we say dates, um, we want to want them to actually come true. Um, so we're, we're being really careful here right now, and we'll give you dates as soon as we possibly can. I will say this is something that you typed uh jp but i didn't mention while i was talking about the the limited mainnet release um it will have the the whole new client so you, you'll get to kind of explore influence uh again like it's the first time um in in the whole new ui uh taking all those those actions maybe you've got some asteroids that you've held back on scanning um or you know you're wanting to walk through your crew assignments um that's all gonna be in the new ui which yeah. i think we're we're all really, really excited to, uh, to Chris to go a little bit further, just so that the, maybe uh, maybe we near future color to that. But like the new way to like look at resource maps and things like that in the UI is also going to be there. Uh, is that correct? Oh, um, so like inspecting Sorry, said, asteroids, I, you with cut those out long-range scans, for a the UI for uh, resource maps, and just kind of viewing the belt. 
all that new UI will be there as well. So it's going to. Yes, it yeah. will be there, <laughs> but you won't be able to do the resource scans yet. So yep. yeah, long range does not actually mean that you can go and see this, the spots of each resource because that's. Uh, yes, the, uh, the long range okay. the long range scan is, is specifically the bonuses scan. Um, it's not yet revealed. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put together an article for you guys um, describing kind of the three the three big beats that we have coming up and outline what's within them uh, and what they entail and and then as soon as we have dates we will give you dates. I see multiple people typing, so uh, I'm going to give it a second. <clears throat> question. Nathrax, your question on on changing from the end of summer. I mean, it's it's a valid one. We're you know, still gauging the importance of volition or forty eight forty four, um, but I, I tend to think that it is uh, quite important for us to have a successful launch, just given the the, the cost, um, the transaction cost, and how much lower it gets. Um, so we're, you know, I, I don't really want to say anything before we know better what that date is or, or when that would be. Um, we don't quite yet. It's also uh, something that's that really we'll what, be probably what we are waiting on. Uh, talking to Starkware, Starknet at the summit about as well. Mm -hmm. the, oh, this actually reminds me. Um, <clears throat> speaking speaking of that, I was it was confirmed that the testnet right will be played using Girly ETH, and it's not going to cost you anything to basically. Um, explore the full functionality of the game on t on testnet, um, and so in a way that that should be <clears throat> time enough to cheer uh, when when we do get it right, and then we'll be able to see you know how close that forty eight forty four kind of patch is when we patch the mainnet. Um, but the transaction costs on testnet will like basically be zero. That's right, Chris. That that's when you explained it to me. That's that's how I understood it to be. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I think that there is an actual market for girl ETH now, but even then, like the cost of playing for the entire testnet period would probably be on the order of two cents. Um, and like I said, we we are the uh, we're the number one uh, wallet on the rich list on um, on girly for. For Starknet, so we're going to do what we can to distribute whatever's uh, whatever's necessary so people can play and they don't have yeah, to worry right. about acquiring Gorilla Ether. Yeah, so this should be as close to f test for free or play for free. Yeah, and on the look, test. I know there's a lot of terms: yes, mainnet, yes, testnet, exactly. pre-release, beta. All this stuff can get kind of confusing. Um, easy way to think about this is, you know, pre-release is a beta. It is free to play because it's on Gorly, and anything on mainnet will be on Starknet going forward, and it has a cost per transaction, and that is in ETH. Uh, but it it's a good point here. The more that we talk about it, um, I I need to I need to write an article for everyone. Get that either on the wiki or the Substack. And make it abundantly clear um, exactly what's what's happening, and I think we have the clarity now internally to to be able to do that. So um, appreciate your guys's patience. Uh, we don't have a date for for anything yet, and we will give you a date as soon as we can. Um, let's see here. There's um, another question here, uh, Darius. We have not talked about ship cargo um, sizes. Um, Proto, do you want to give an update on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is not strictly speaking an update. I think we've mentioned it in the past AMAs, but um, we did make the decision that um, ship 
propellant tanks specifically can only hold propellant, so hydrogen propellant, um, you know, that you can use to fly the ship around. Um, previously, we've been thinking that you might also be able to pack other volatiles into there. Um, and keep in mind that the ship propellant tanks have a very large volume um, since hydrogen propellant is very low density. Um, so using those propellant tanks to haul other volatiles, you know, that might also be low density would be a really convenient way to sort of cram a lot of low density materials into your ship. Um, but because we decided that only propellant can go into those propellant tanks, um, that means that if we left the cargo holds um, at the sort of same size as they currently were, which was, you know, um, for the light transport, it was like 2,000 um, uh, uh, tons of material in mass terms and 1,500 cubic meters in volume terms. Um, so, you know, less less dense than, or sort of more dense than water, rather. Like, there's there not a lot of space in there. Um, and what that means is that you would actually be able to haul a very small amount of low density materials like hydrogen or, or hydrogen propellant itself um, in that cargo hold. And so the uh, conclusion there is that basically we need to make the cargo hold be a lot bigger um, volume terms, not, not mass terms, but volume terms, um, so that you can actually haul some of those lower density volatiles around efficiently on your ship while still having the propellant tank be full of actual normal propellant. Um, obviously, shipping propellant in the propellant tank is, is something you can certainly do, um, and that might be the preferred way to do it usually. But the cargo hold will also be made um, considerably bigger in terms of exactly how much bigger um, volume-wise it will be. My best guess right now is that it will probably be, you know, something along the lines of half the size of the propellant tanks. So not not identically the same size as, as the propellant tanks, but you know, fairly large. So you can get a fairly significant amount of, um, say, hydrogen into into that cargo hold, um, into the hold, or you can visualize it as sort of strapping it to the outside of the ship. Like there's some sort of, you know, as long as you balance the ship, that's totally something you can do. <laughs> um, but you know, overall, though, you will be able to get some of the volatiles into your ship. Um, it won't be like impossible to ship hydrogen around the belt. Nafax is asking, are there any Shipping plans to... Propellant and the propellant tank. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just saying, that's ship and propellant and the propellant tank. That'll be yep. another that's first. That's way to do it. I mean, you, can, you would do both, probably, if you were trying to maximize everything. You would fill both the cargo hold and the propellant tank with the propellant, and then burn as little of the propellant as you can to get where you're going to, to market. Mm -hmm. and then whatever's left over in both of those different inventories, you'd be able to sell. You know, or you know, whatever is left over, minus the amount you need to get back again. <laughs> Um, Mathrex was asking, like, are there any plans to add the ability in custom contracts to ban certain buildings from asteroids? Um, so this is basically talking about asteroid zoning, like how do you enforce what people build on your asteroid if you're an asteroid landlord? Um, and the answer is that the default, like the standard lease that we offer, does not have any kind of zoning built into it. So if you want to do that, you would need to do that in a custom contract type policy on your asteroid. Um, one thing you certainly could do is make it so that any agreements spawned from that policy um, would you know protect your your building from being evicted like as as you know sort of lot control policies do um, except in the case that if you build a building that was of the wrong type um, and so having a building there that was of the of a wrong type like wasn't zoned how you wanted it to be zoned that would allow you to go in and evict them um, so that might be kind of a good way to enforce people not building the right buildings but you can't stop them from building something like if they if they control that lot they they can build whatever they want on it um, but yes the custom contract could allow you to sort of have repercussions for doing the wrong thing. Yeah, because I was going to say, the, the one thing the custom contract does is just it governs a permission, but ultimately it's it's just a binary. Is the permission to control this lot granted? If the answer is yes, then they can do whatever they want. Um, but yeah, you described a perfect way around that to sort of enforce. You can't stop them from building a marketplace, but you can say, if you build the building that I didn't want you to build here, I'm just going to take it and take yeah, over. And these are cool ones, basically, right? like with a, a lease that you sign for an apartment. You know, it's like if you build a fireplace in your lease, you're going to be in violation of the terms of the lease, and we will evict you. You know, it's like if, if you do any of this long list of things that we don't want you to do, like we have the legal right to evict you. And that's that's something you could absolutely put code into a, a custom contract. Um, Harry is asking, do we have better ideas on what average trip times are? Quarter rim, one side or the other? Are you balancing this to a time you think is good? Um, I would say that the best idea we have gotten so far has been um, from the uh, sort of pork chop plot UI flow that um, we've been playing with or, you know, a few months ago. Um, I think that's not been the focus recently, but but we had some time to play with that. And we did our best to balance the um, specifically the ship propellant velocity, which sets ISP, like the efficiency of, of your ships, um, sort of the delta V that you can get from them. Um, we we try our best to balance that so that like most 
places in the belt that are reasonably nearby can be gotten to within you know sort of the amount of time or the amount of propellant that, that the typical player will have on their ship. Um, that does not mean that you can get everywhere in the belt at, you know, period. Like there are some places that are just take too much propellant or take too much time to get to um, and your food would run out. And so um, I think the answer to that though is, is that you know the, the upper limit on travel time is, remind me what it was, Chris, is it, is it two Adalian years or is it a year and a half that we set that, that maximum time to be? But um, it's food based. I mean, it's it's as I, I believe. I believe it's a year and a half. Okay, I think so it's a year and a half. That's what happens like when your food runs out. If if you have um, no bonuses related to food consumption anyway, I assume that gets a little bit longer if if you are able to extend your food consumption. But um, an Andalian year is ten eighty one hours. Um, yeah, right? it's, so this would be in the effect yeah, of exactly. hours. Yeah, exactly. Sort of six, you know, I think six weeks. In that Earth room. hours um, yeah. to for a maximum length of trip time, and beyond that, you just can't take a trip. So you know anything under that, like obviously that's a very long time. That would be if you were extending yourself to the absolute maximum. But, you know you can certainly expect all trip, almost all trip times to take in the days plus range. Um, it's this is a it's a serious commitment you're making. You're not you know waltzing over something in a few minutes. Plus it's like literally next to you. Uh, we have a really good question from a gamer here about like what will ships be like. He's he's new to the community, so uh, he hasn't had the long term knowledge. Chris, do you want to maybe give a little bit of info there? Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a little bit more um, more like uh, Star Citizen, where where you're saying you need a certain ship to do something. There are three classes of ships initially. Um, so there's a, a light transport, a heavy transport, and shuttles, and they all kind of have their their unique roles. Um, so light transports are are ac actually able to land um, somewhere beside a spaceport, um, so that they, they are kind of like necessary to get started on on a bare asteroid. You you can't land and start doing anything without um, being on a light transport. And then they also double as kind of like a smaller uh, transport ship. So they're they're somewhat a um, a Swiss Army knife. Uh, can do a lot of different things. Um, then the heavy transport is is very, very suited towards just hauling. Um, it can only land in the spaceport, but it can haul a lot. I think it's about six times more than a light transport. Um, and then finally, you've got the shuttle, which is oriented around um, moving more quickly uh, and at a less propellant cost and moving um, people, moving the crewmates and crews around uh, around the belt. So they each have kind of unique. Uh, roles initially, but that will expand pretty significantly in the uh, the discovery phase. Uh, and, and to be clear, um, you do not fly these ships uh, as if you were, you know, a dogfighter in space or something. Uh, you're 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 um, you're you're setting these ships on a course, and you interact with them uh, more so in the planning phase and the landing phase than in the middle of their trip. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Chris, but I, I think that's probably a pretty important factor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can think of ships more as like a chess piece that you you choose what moves you make with it, um, but it's on a sort of higher level. It's not like yeah, you're, you're in Kerbal where you're picking which direction the thrust goes or stuff like that. Like we're we are we are modeling the the accurate you know physics behind those, um, but it's part of. You know, it feeds into the the numbers that you decide on when you are moving your yeah you'll you'll forward. periodically if let's say you've got a bunch of ships check in on where are your ships in the belt how close are they to landing you'll do strat strategic you know research on the marketplaces that you're going to be nearest to and what prices you might want to put for your materials you have in their cargo uh, and then you'll be able to continue playing with your other crews that are not on the ships and are on asteroids while your ships are in movement so um it's it's a constant uh, you know game of trying to figure out what you have access to and uh, what's the most impactful action you can be taking also in terms of in the in the actual exploitation release of the game like what will you see when you like go to your ship um so basically you, you'd find out where your ship is in the belt you know so you go into my assets in the asteroid system view and, and look for your ships or you go to a particular asteroid and you know look in either orbit or on on the surface where your ship is you click on on that lot or on that ship and you you end up in ship view which is a special view in the game which would actually show you like the 3d model of the ship that you can spin around um, and look at that from different angles and ultimately our goal is to have ship view um be sort of 
special specialized for each of the, the locations your ship could be in. So like, you know, in a spaceport or on the on the surface or launching to orbit or in orbit or traveling between asteroids, like those would all have different views. I believe that our initial sort of MVP there is just to have sort of the um, in orbit around the asteroid view. I, I think that's MVP and then possibly just the traveling one with, with nothing around it except for sort of streaking through space. But you will be able to see that ship model and that will be where you will like look and see like, oh, here's here's the crew that's in the ship and here's the, the cargo that's in the ship and how much propellant it is and how much longer it has on this trip if it's on a trip or what, what passengers are in there. So all that sort of ship, ship related information and also setting the, the policies on that ship if you own it um, so you can sort of decide who, who gets to use it, how. Um, but that's, that's sort of what you'd see when you're looking at a ship. Anthrax is a, a fun question, which we have thought about, and I think is is a, a pretty cool uh, concept that we're exploring for discovery. But this, the idea that you can have a ship that has like an extraction or, or refining module on it, um, and sort of allow for uh, non tied down you know, squatters to kind of fly around and find the best spots and just quickly extract what they need and fly off again. So um, I think pretty fun. Uh, that's oh, nice, great. like a moonshot. I want that already. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I tell you, I went, so we we went through a pretty substantial uh, redesign, like probably back towards the beginning of the year, um, to make sure that we could support you know the the large amount of additional functionality that will come with influence, um, and not that it's not quite large already, but um, after exploitation into discovery and conflict, um, so designed around uh, ECS, which is a pretty common approach for, for building games with quite a few customizations to support um, what we want to do on chain. Uh, but pretty much as soon as we did that and, and sort of took the, um, we, we had some some ECS pieces in the in the early earlier test net and then kind of expanded that out to the to every part of the game, all of the entities in the game. As soon as we did that, it was like, oh man, this would be so much fun to have have these ships that could double as buildings. Like orbital orbital buildings and platforms are very possible. Um, ships that can become buildings or vice versa is possible. So there's a lot of, a lot of cool things that are um, uh, are possible for discovery, and we're we're kind of excited to explore all of those once we once we get exploitation launched, and and that becomes our primary focus. Uh, I see Corvax typing, but uh, other than that, not a lot of other questions. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Again, you're new here. Um, I'm always curious how people found us and, you know, sparked your interest. Um, and you've got some good questions. So I think I think you're you're going to be welcomed here. If you're not already being poached by some of the alliances, uh, you're, you're probably going to be <laughs> getting an invite sh shortly. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just saying gamer yeah, because I, I, I <laughs> that's how my brain wants to think that it said. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Comstar is not Ignore any I offers of cookies. Have. That's, that's, <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do them carefully anyway. Is it worth it? Uh, well, uh, okay, so I think we're pretty much at time here. I see that they're typing, so I'll give them an opportunity, but past that, I think we're probably, okay, no more questions. Um, you know, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, we're going to be at StarkNet Summit next week. So if you live in the Bay Area, San Francisco, or you're near there and you wanna stop by, reach out, let me know. I will make sure that I, I will tell you where we're at on that Thursday event, um, and we can we can come say hi. We'll we'll also have some some goodies uh, to give out, so maybe maybe you can do that. I don't know if anyone here will be there, but uh, if if by chance you are, uh, we've got a t-shirt for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. and don't, don't and don't forget back to back. Yep. Uh, Chris is flying right back from StarkNet on the same day that I will be at DragonCon, and we're actually having a little meetup on Sunday, September 3rd. Um, JP already mentioned this, but if anybody is in the Atlanta area at 3 p.m. on Sunday, wants to meet us, 
and talk some influence. Give us a shout out. I've already got a table reserved, but I am sure I might even all I might even try and send any, uh, any other Chris random takers. Greater Frost, and no. uh, maybe you can have those to give out. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks I'll definitely have for, some stickers and maybe some shirts. Um, as well, I'll have so. the recording up on YouTube shortly, and um, if you got any questions, just put them in game questions, and we'll be we'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, have a good one. Later, Adalians. Take care. Thanks. Cheers, everyone.